Hi everyone, I'm Ben Atwood. I was at Yeshiva Haratzion from 2014 through 2016, and it's my pleasure to be able to share some words of Torah with you this week. How would you lead in times of unprecedented upheaval? How do you manage resources in moments of scarcity? Over the last year and a half, we've asked this question oh so many times. We've seen some leaders succeed, go above and beyond the call of duty, maintaining the confidence, the respect, the fealty of their constituents. And unfortunately, we've seen some leaders fall short, lose that confidence, lose that respect, lose that fealty. At the end of this week's Parsha, Parsha Vayigash, we come across a strange, rather lengthy passage, a back and forth between Yosef and the people of Egypt over famine, over the way they're going to acquire food. We're in the middle of discussing how the tribes, Yosef's brothers, are settling in Egypt in the land of Goshen, when suddenly we read the words, the lechem ein bechol ha'aretz, and there was no bread in the land, for the famine was so great. Yosef gathers all the money together, the people's money, and uses it to purchase bread to satisfy the needs of everyone. But then the money runs out, and they have nothing else to pay for bread. So they offer their cattle. They sell all their cattle. Yosef takes everything, all the animals they own, and gives them bread. But soon the cattle is spent, and they offer their land, and Yosef takes all their land and makes them slaves to the land, serfs to the land, sharecroppers. All the land is owned by Paro. The verse specifically tells us all the land was owned by Paro, except for the land of the priests, the Egyptian Kohanim. Their land was not taken. And then we end the Parsha, and Israel resided in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, were fruitful and multiplied. What's going on here? What's with these, this insertion of this random series of verses? What's the purpose of this narrative? And what's the deal with this priestly exemption? Why were the priests exempt from their land being taken? If we look at Rashi, and we look at the Ramban, and Rav Hirsch, and then at Siv, and the vast, vast majority of commentators, they all view Yosef's actions here as positive. He's ingenious. He's brilliant. He's able to craft a way to both give bread to his family as well as the people of Egypt in a way that perhaps no other leader could have done. However, that doesn't really satisfy me. I think if we look a little deeper, we actually come across an image of Yosef that's a, less, that's a bit less positive than the way these commentators are understanding the narrative. The story of this back and forth between Yosef and the people is sandwiched between verses that describe the wealth, the prosperity, the success of Yosef's brothers, the tribes in the land of Goshen. Right before this story, we are told, and Yosef sustained his brothers, his father, the entire house of his father. Even they had enough bread for the children to satisfy their desires. They had lechem. They all had bread. And then immediately afterwards, we're told, the lechem ein bechola aretz. However, in the rest of the land, bechola aretz, there was no bread. At the end of the story, we're told the Egyptians no longer have any land. All the land belongs to Paro except for the priests. And one other group, in the last verse, we're told that Yosef's brothers lived and settled in the land of Goshen. And the text, the verse emphasizes Vayach Zuba. They took hold of the land. They acquired the land. They were prosperous. They were successful on their land. It seems like Yosef freely gave substance to his family while charging the Egyptians everything they owned to take out of the storehouses bread for his people. Now, if you look at this reality, it's not so crazy to imagine why the Egyptians eventually began to harbor hatred towards the Israelites. It's clear that the context was set up for propaganda, the opportunity for the next Paro to come and spread anti-Israelite propaganda, not to justify Paro's actions, but perhaps it sheds a little light on the context that it's seeing the prosperity, the favors that were given to Yosef's family, but weren't given to the rest of the Egyptian people. And Yosef's actions do not constitute only a societal injustice, giving to his family while not giving to the people of Egypt, but they're also an injustice to God. And we can see through some of Yosef's actions how his actions run counter to the way that God wants us to run a divinely inspired, divinely sanctioned society. And this is displayed in four clear ways. Number one, the people become slaves to Paro at the end of the story forever. 
While we know that in the Torah, you can't become a slave forever. God does not support eternal slavery. You can only become a slave for seven years. And if you want to become a slave for longer, only up to 50. We're also told in these verses that all the land belonged to Paro. But in the Torah, you can't take the land from someone permanently. Someone, ha every family, every tribe has their own plot of land. And even if they sell it, if they need to, financial difficulty, they need to make money. At the end of 50 years, in the year of Yovel, the land goes back to them. Taking the land from the people was opposed to the way God wants us to work with land. And number three, the people come to Yosef and they say, Lama namut le'enecha. Why should we die in front of your eyes by not having bread? This reminds me of when Bnei Israel, the people of Israel, come to Moses, come to Moshe in the desert, and they say, why should we die in this desert without food, without water? And when they complain, it's clearly negative that they complain, does God charge them? Does God expect anything from them in return when he sustains them? No. He freely gives them water. He freely gives them the slav. He freely gives them water from the rock and satisfies their desires. And in terms of the priests, number four, in this narrative, the priests are treated better than the other people. Their land isn't taken while the rest of the people's land is taken. While in the Torah, the Kohanim are the one people who do not have land. And some understand that as a buffer to show that the priests, the Kohanim in Bnei Israel, are not better than the rest of the people. But they're actually equal. And that's why they don't get land and they have to rely on everyone else for land. But in this story, the Kohanim, not only are they priests and elevated above the rest of the people, but they also are the only ones with land at the end of the story. We see from here that Yosef is a very complicated figure. We know that sometimes he's a pure tzaddik, always being God-fearing and recognizing God. But at the same time, sometimes he seems a little arrogant. Sometimes he lacks a little faith. And here, too, we have different ways we can understand Yosef's actions. We can be like Rashi Ramban and most of the commentators and say they, it was amazing, it was ingenious, it was brilliant. Or we can look at the text and say, maybe Yosef did here something wrong. Maybe he should have treated the people he was in charge of, the people of Egypt, the same way that he treated his own family. This is a lesson of leadership, not only for people in official capacities of leadership, but people in all walks of life, in our social circles, in our families, in our congregations, in our communities. Do we show dignity and respect and kindness to only some people, the people we're close to, the people we feel connected to and not to others? Do we share that with everyone else? And when we see that resources for something are limited in society, do we make sure that those resources are spread out and make sure that everyone gets them and not just the people close to us? Do we look inside our houses and see we have lechem, yesh lanu lechem, but then we look outside and say, but lechem ein b'chol ha'aretz, and we notice that there is no bread in the land, and we say we need to do something about that. We need to make sure the resources are spread out, and we're not just treating the people closer to us better than everyone else. Hopefully, the strange, strange passage at the end of Ayigash motivates us to build on the mistakes of the past, build a better world, a divinely inspired world, using Yosef's image as a way to make us better and work towards a better future, towards a Geulah Shleimah Bimhira Thank you.